I have a mission. A little while ago, I was scrolling through Wikipedia, and I learned that the first dinosaur statues ever built, the statues based off of the first three dinosaurs ever named, are still standing. And I really want to see them before they go the way of the rest of the dinosaurs. The only problem is, they're in London. So I guess I'm going to London. Here's my plan. Step one, fly to London. Step two, find the oldest dinosaur statues in the world. And step three, learn about their history from a source other than Wikipedia, which definitely isn't the source that I turn to for literally everything I ever learn. We are on the train on our way to the Crystal Palace Park right now. And for those of you who didn't know, in a previous video about pterosaurs, I actually talked about the Crystal Palace Park. And so I know a little bit about it, but I don't know a ton. Fortunately, I've been emailing back and forth for a little while with a guy named Andrew from the park. And he's more of an expert on the park than I am. So he's gonna be giving us a tour and we just have to meet up with him when we get to Crystal Palace Station. And hopefully we can find him when we get there. A few minutes later, we arrived at the Crystal Palace Overground Station. Now, while I'm trying to find Andrew, I should probably explain why I keep mentioning the Crystal Palace Park. It's the park where the oldest dinosaur statues were built, and both it and the dinosaur statues were named after a building called the Crystal Palace. And I'll let Andrew explain a little bit more about that after we find him. Anyway, this was the cafe we were supposed to meet Andrew at, but right outside of it was a replica of one of the Crystal Palace Iguanodon heads, and there was a sign under it talking about a literal feast that was held inside of one of the Iguanodons while it was still under construction. And I was just about to make a comment on it when... Oh, here's Andrew. That's me. Hey man, how's it going? Good, good nice to meet you. Me. You found the Iguanodon, is it? We did, yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> is it okay if we mic you really quickly? Yeah, 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 of course. Okay, cool. yeah. All look good? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Okay. And thanks for doing this, this is super cool. Yeah, I, I, this is a, uh, yeah, you, obviously you haven't been here yet. Nope. So nope. Your, your first experience is here. Uh -huh. Okay, that's great. How do you want to, how do you want to start? Because obviously this is just at the edge of the park. Yeah. The, the sculptures are further down the hill. Yeah. There's an amazing art mural just around the corner there, which you might want to do a shot of. I did in fact want to do a shot of it. And here's the shot. Wow, that's pretty cool. Cool. I know, I know, it's a cool mural, but we also thought it was a good place for Andrew to tell us a little bit of a brief history of the Crystal Palace before we go and look at the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. The Crystal Palace was a huge um, glass and iron building at the, at the top of this hill here, which was a giant, effectively a giant Victorian uh, theme park. Inside were sculptures from throughout history, both modern and ancient. There were, there, there were art galleries, natural history installations. The whole grounds, uh, 200 acres, was landscaped around water fountains. Um, and the, the, the sculptures are at the very end of the park. And when the Crystal Palace burnt down in 1936, the park fell into, in, in sort, of, sort of disuse. Especially yeah. mixed with the Second World War as well. Did it, and did it take damage from the Second World War, or was it the actual park, or the all of the above? Yeah, I mean, so so this area of London was hit a lot in in the German Blitz of 1940, 1941. The park itself, in, in the grounds of the park, um, several bombs fell. Uh, six V1 flying bombs fell in the in the ground of the grounds of the park as well. Great. The park was <laughs> the park was closed and um, occupied by the army who were doing various bits and bobs. There were rumours that the sculptures were used for target practice. Um, one of the plesiosaurs lost its head and other bits and bobs, but we don't think, we, we don't, we don't think anyone was shooting at them. Well, let's head on up. Let's, let's go okay. take a look at the statues. Good. So yeah, the Crystal Palace has some crazy history. And now that you know a little of that history, you're probably wondering why they chose to build dinosaurs as part of the park's decorations. And the answer is because dinosaurs are cool and they already knew that in the 1800s. That's it. No, for real though, dinosaurs were just beginning to become popular back then. In fact, Sir Richard Owen had only coined the term dinosaur just 12 years before these statues were built. And the three dinosaur statues in the park were the three dinosaurs Owen used to come up with the name dinosaur. Anyway, at this point, I really just wanted to see the dinosaur statues, and I wasn't about to let anything distract me from my mission. Yeah, get a video of the dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all joking aside, it wasn't actually the dog that was keeping us from getting to the dinosaur statues, it was the other prehistoric creatures before the dinosaurs. 
You see, the part of the park with all of the statues is called the Geologic Court. And it's called that because it's an island of statues that's divided into three geologic time periods. The Paleozoic Era, the Mesozoic Era, and the Cenozoic Era. And the dinosaurs are all in the Mesozoic Era part of the island, which is right in the middle of all of the statues. So, in order to see the dinosaurs, Andrew took us past all of the Paleozoic creatures and taught us a little about them. And I cut that part out of this video, but if you guys want to learn about some of those other creatures, just let me know in the comments section. Anyway, after just 11 hours of flying, a two hour layover in New York, a train ride, and a quarter mile of walking, I finally reached the dinosaur statues. Here we have the main three, three dinosaurs, which Richard, Owen, which Richard Owen used to, to, to coin the phrase. Yeah. in 1842. So we've got the Megalosaurus, Hylosaurus, Hylosaurus. and two Iguanodons. Why two? Um, first of all, the, the Iguanodon, I think, out of all three was the most famous mm -hmm. at the time. It was the most, the most had been found of the, um, of the Iguanodon compared to the other two. And what I still, like Iguanodon, out of the three of these, if you just asked a random person off of the street, they'd probably be able to tell you that Iguanodon was the dinosaur. Yes. Out of these three. Yeah. Hi Hyliosaurus, I don't think that anyone could probably tell you is a dinosaur. One of the things I find fascinating about the Hyliosaurus and the Megalosaurus is that, all in all, not that much has been found of them since. I mean, obviously, in the Megalosaurus, enough has been found to know what kind of creature it was. Yeah. But we still haven't found anything remotely like a like a, a complete specimen. Yeah. Okay. Now that I've found the statues, I'd like to share a little of what Andrew taught me about how the statues came to be. Like, who built them, and why do they look so weird? The statues were designed and built by a man named Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, who was a famous sculptor from back in the day and the first man to mount a dinosaur skeleton. He was commissioned by the Crystal Palace to build 33 statues of prehistoric life, including the three dinosaur statues. It was thought that Hawkins' designs for the statues were based on research by Sir Richard Owen, one of the biggest names in paleontology from back then, but now we kind of think maybe they weren't. And were all of the depictions based off of stuff that Richard Owen, Sir Richard Owen, was kind of feeding to Waterhouse Hawkins? This is the big, um, this is the big thing we've been researching and a lot of other kind of science historians are researching. We question the amount of input that Richard Owen had um, into, um, into the actual creatures. So for example, with the, with the, with the labyrinthodon that turned, that turned out to be frog-like, um, largely because it was fossils were found near footprints of a completely different creature. Um, and so it was because of the frog legs, I think that, that impacted what Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins thought the creature might have looked like. Richard Owen at the time thought the skull looked like a salamander, which with the creatures that we know now, the, the uh, temnospondyls, they were giant amphibians that were much more like um, giant salamanders than, than kind of crazy frogs. But it was, um, it was just Waterhouse Hawkins translating what he thought and also obviously changing, changing the kind of skull to fit the rest of the, of, the, of the creature. So not only were the statues based off of 1800s paleontology, they were also possibly based off of Waterhouse Hawkins' incorrect interpretations of 1800s paleontology which explains why they look the way they do. Hylosaurus is arguably the most accurate because it's on four legs and it's yeah. got some armor. Yeah. And while the Hylosaurus is the most accurate of these weird looking dinosaurs, I would beg to argue that the least accurate are the Iguanodons. Because not only are they in a quadrupedal stance like some kind of a mammal, they also put a rhinoceros nose horn on them because that's what they thought the Iguanodon thumb spike was supposed to be. The biggest question that I have about them is do we know which of the dinosaur statues was made first? Or is that kind of lost to history? He just kind of was working on all of them. He was working on all of them. So we've got some original, there are some original photos um, from about 1854, I think there's four main photos that show this work area under under construction. And one of the problems we've got is that you see um, you see them as being under a kind of under under a hut, yeah. almost. So you're you're looking at you're looking at kind of the the dinosaurs and then some huts. And I th it's possible that the iguanodons were made first because I think there's a photo of the iguanodons and then the megalosaurus like under a hut. Was this one of the main attractions of the Crystal Palace back in the day? 
Or was the Crystal Palace really still the main attraction of the Crystal Palace? The Crystal Palace itself was still the main attraction because this was, if you were if you were arriving into the Crystal Palace, you would you would arrived in by one of the main entrances or the train station up, up at the up at the hill. So this, if you were visiting the Crystal Palace, this would have been probably the last thing. This would have been you walking walking down the hill, and the Crystal Palace guidebooks obviously mention the outside of the Crystal Palace after the inside. Yeah. And this usually is the is the kind of is the kind of footnote. But in terms of the in terms of the kind of newspaper articles of the time, you know, this caused quite a stir. What you have as well is the main railway line going across there. So people and can look out of the train and see that. As they were arriving, there is obviously this was all pretty much mud um, when the when the Crystal Palace first opened. Um, the first thing they would have seen is the um, is is these big dinosaur statues? Wow. Now, in my personal opinion, especially now that the Crystal Palace building has burned down, I think that the Crystal Palace dinosaurs are the main attraction of the park. But whether or not they're the main attraction, over 171 years have gone by since Waterhouse Hawkins built the statues, and that means that they have 171 years of wear and tear on them. And our Myasaura statue isn't quite that old, but you can see that sometimes dinosaur statues need repair work done, like we're about to give this one a fresh coat of paint. And that's why before I get to the last part of this video, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the Friends of the Crystal Palace Dinosaurs. They're the organization that Andrew volunteers for, and their main goal is to help raise awareness and occasion funds to help with the maintenance and curation of the dinosaur statues. For example, a little while ago, the Megalosaurus' bottom jaw fell off and they rallied together with the community to raise enough money to assist with the repair work. And I just think it's amazing that there are good people out there like the Friends of the Crystal Palace Dinosaurs that are willing to do good things for their communities like that. Now, while we're on the topic of repair work, you may have noticed that some of the statues look a little bit worse for wear, and that's because they're actually getting ready right now to do a full renovation of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. And we were actually super lucky that we got to the park when we did, because renovations were scheduled to start the next Tuesday. Wow, I am so glad that we were able to make it here when we did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we very nearly missed this. Got some fairly, fairly looked out with the British weather. Yeah. Anyway, that said, I feel like I successfully finished my mission. I had now learned about the Crystal Palace dinosaurs from a source other than Wikipedia, and after Andrew was done teaching us about them, he took us around to see the rest of the statues and to teach us a little bit about them. But once we were done with that, we shook hands and went our separate ways. The next day, I was on a plane and on my way back to America. But hold on, you guys didn't expect me to fly all the way to London just to film one video, did you? Oh no, I filmed not one, not two, but three separate videos for you guys while I was in England, including a trip to the Jurassic Coast to go fossil hunting, and my visit to the London Natural History Museum. So if you don't want to miss those videos, make sure you hit the subscribe button and click the bell notification button. But until then, I'd like to give a huge shout out and a thank you to Andrew. Thank you so, so much for filming this video with us. We couldn't have made it happen without you. A very special thanks to my family who gave up part of their vacation time to let me do this video. And especially thank you to James, who was the cameraman behind almost this whole thing. And thank you to you guys for watching this video. We can't make this channel happen without you. And I'll see you in the next video.